All right, perfect. All right, so like I said, lake trout population crashed uh, late 1940s, early 1950s. So starting in about 1965, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service began stocking lake trout um, lake-wide. So I'm more focused on Illinois, so I'll probably be talking a lot about Illinois here, sorry. Um, first stocking in Illinois happened in 1967 at the Great Lakes Naval Station. Um, all these initial stockings occurred from shore. Um, basically, these kind of grouping of access points, they were just dumping fish in there. After about a decade or so, biologists decided it might, uh, might help fish kind of get a jump start on finding good spawning habitat if we actually dump them in at, uh, at known historical spawning grounds uh, offshore. So um, in 1976, I believe they started stocking fish at known offshore reefs. Um, in Illinois, they started at Wilmette Reef and, uh, and Waukegan Reef. Wilmette Reef used to be called Glencoe Reef. Um, and then since about 1981, Julian's Reef has kind of become the primary site for lake trout stocking in Illinois. Um, so after all these decades of lake trout stocking, which has continued on since then, uh, the Illinois DNR essentially has two main annual surveys that they use to monitor uh, the lake trout rehabilitation progress. Uh, so in the spring, they set a series of gill nets on uh, two transects moving offshore from Waukegan, Illinois. Um, and then in the fall, they uh, center on two spawning reefs and conduct another gill net survey that's looking for larger, more mature spawning fish. Um, and these surveys are done uh, collaboratively uh, with all the states surrounding the lake. So during these surveys, we collect a wide amount of uh, a wide array of biological information, all of which goes towards, like I said, assessing the success of those rehabilitation efforts for the lake trout population. Um, one of the things we look for is a fin clip that indicates that those fi a fish came from a hatchery. All the lake trout that are stocked into Lake Michigan currently get a small fin clip that alerts us to the fact that they were stocked. Um, and for many decades, uh, even prior to the start of these graphs, which started in 2002, um, we saw very little to no actual natural reproduction. So all the fish that were coming in had one of those fin clips. Starting in around 2008, 2009, we began to actually see uh, a few fish coming in uh, that were not clipped. And so these graphs just show uh, the percentage of unclipped fish uh, during those spring and fall surveys. And as you can see, starting in about 2008, 2009, we started to see more and more actually wild, naturally produced fish coming in. Um, and it's only continued to increase um, over time. Um, and this is essentially the same information shown lakewide. So Illinois is that top left graph that I have circled. Um, and uh, Indiana is to the right, and then uh, different regions of Michigan and Wisconsin. So as you can see, Illinois has kind of been the leader in this down in the southwest corner of the lake. Um, other states have kind of started to catch up and are also seeing more and more wild lake trout appear. However, over the last decade, Illinois has, uh, has by far had the largest numbers of wild lake trout. So, Kind of moving over to a new topic. This is uh, a map of the lake that was made um, in around 2008, I believe, for a report on the lake trout rehabilitation progress. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of, these are all priority habitats being listed here. So you can see there's a lot of reefs and shoals up in the northern portion of the lake. Um, and then if you come down more into the center off of Milwaukee, there's what's called the Mid Lake Reef Complex. And then down in the very left corner is all by its lonesome is Julian's Reef, right? And to be honest, they didn't even get it in the right spot. It's actually right there. So um, one other thing that we do when uh, giving fish a hatchery fin clip, nowadays all fish act also get what's called a coated wire tag. So this is a small metal tag that goes into the snout of the fish that contains a six digit code that we can read under a microscope. And that tells us exactly where and when that fish was stocked. So because we collect a lot of fish with these, it's kind of opened up uh, the floodgates to a ton of information about lake trout movement. Not that we weren't um, 
expecting them to move around, but we do now know roughly to what degree they do. So, for instance, during our fall survey at Julian's Reef, the fall lake trout survey I spoke about earlier in 2021, uh, of all the stocked lake trout that we collected, 17% of them were actually stocked at the Mid Lake Reef Complex, which is a distance of about 70 miles. Um, furthermore, you know, over the last several years, at least, uh, the, the lake trout that we collect, the stocked lake trout that we collect in Illinois, somewhere between, between 10 and 25% of them were usually stocked all the way there at the Mid Lake Reef Complex, and some of them even further up in Northern Lake Michigan. So this has opened our eyes to the degree that with, to which lake trout move around, find new spawning habitats, even though we put them on one spawning habitat, hoping they'll come in back to that specific spot, they do move around, they do find new locations. So this kind of information made the DNR more interested in what other kind of areas we have that lake trout might be utilizing in this region, especially now that there's this larger and growing uh, population of wild fish. So moving back a little bit, um, as I discussed earlier, during the 70s, we decided that we should try to find historical spawning grounds to actually start late stocking lake trout on offshore. So this led, uh, this map was produced by the Illinois State Geological Survey. And uh, just to kind of orient you, this is essentially the entire Illinois shoreline. Chicago makes up maybe the bottom third to a half of it. Um, so you can see a large smattering of small nearshore reefs um, all the way up and down the coast. Um, and then in the offshore area, you see a, a handful of larger, uh, larger reefs that are centered more in the northern Illinois waters. So I'll kind of zoom in on that northern portion of the map. Um, it's getting a bit cut off here, but you kind of get the idea. You can see some of the reefs I was talking about earlier. Um, Wilmette Reef there down kind of in the bottom center. Julian's Reef is one of the most well-known uh, spawning sites for lake trout. And then further up in very small print, if I can circle it, I wonder, right there is uh, Waukegan Reef. So this was helpful. Um, it's not exactly an aid to navigation, obviously, but um, it let us know that there's a lot of habitat out there that we maybe wanted to get a better understanding of, and maybe could be potentially other lake trout spawning sites now that we know that we've got this many wild fish and fish are moving around quite a bit. So, um, changing gears again slightly. In 2010, these two main spawning sites that the DNR has been surveying for many, many years, we wanted to get a better idea of what they actually looked like and what type of habitat was available. So at Julian's Reef and Waukegan Reef, uh, our lab conducted a, a large scale side scan sonar survey um, to actually assess the amount of habitat available at those reefs. And we were able to um, get a lot of imagery to actually see what type of substrates composed of that habitat and uh, what the distribution of potential spawning habitat looked like. Then moving forward a bit, like I said, as this population of wild fish began to grow and we got more and more interested in what that population might look like at other potential spawning sites, um, we actually took to the water and tried to map uh, some of these other reefs that we had on this previous map because we couldn't exactly use this map to help us go out there and set gill nets to try to survey them. So over the course of a few years, we visited all of these reefs, including one down here at the bottom that wasn't even on this map, um, and basically drove transects collecting depth data so that we can then create bathymetric maps for each one of them. Um, these maps, if you want, actually like blown up versions of them that you can can look at and use. Uh, you can go to the ifishillinois.org website. There's a page for Lake Michigan um, and there's a tab that's called fish habitat and you can download PDFs of all of these uh, maps at these different reefs. Um, another fun thing I've kind of done lately is, so I took these sort of small scale isolated spots where we have this very high resolution depth data and I've tried to combine it with a more, much more coarse bat bathymetry data from NOAA. Um, this is just a five meter bathymetry map. Um, and I've been able to create uh, a larger scale bathymetric map uh, of the Northern Illinois waters 
Um, it's, it's not entirely accurate. These areas where there's sort of gray hashed uh, boxes are areas where we have very high resolution from those reefs. Um, and a lot of those smooth areas, there's obviously a lot more structure there that we're not seeing. But it's just been very interesting to actually put these reefs in context with one another and actually sort of visualize what the lake looks like and, uh, and what this network of potential spawning sites um, looks like. So again, this has been, uh, this was a very interesting piece of the puzzle, actually seeing what some of these habitats look like. We went from, you know, small black blotches on that map I showed you earlier to actually seeing the different structures uh, available out there and you know what their similarities are, what their differences are. Um, and I mentioned before, uh, Julians and Waukegan, the two that I have circled now, uh, we did side scan sonar surveys on in 2010. Um, and so now since 2020, I've completed side scan surveys at uh, five more spots. Um, so these are the bottom left there is Wilmette Reef and what's called Bills Hill next to it. Um, and then Lake Bluff Reef above that, North Reef and what's called Gumby's Reef. So, and that's kind of what I'll be talking about a little more moving forward. Um, so if you have a boat with a more new age, um, you know, sonar GPS unit, you might have a side scan function on that, which is no doubt pretty useful. Um, because we're working offshore in deep water habitats, um, we got a, a little bit higher grade side scan sonar unit so that we can actually send it all the way down on that cable um, and get higher resolution and a wide swath of the lake bed, even in uh, deep water. Um, so this is just a few pictures of us deploying that towfish uh, off the side of our research vessel, and that's what's got the transducers on it sending out sonar pings, receiving them, and then sending them back up that cable to our, uh, our processing unit. So once we run a series of transects all the way across the reef, um, we get essentially something that looks like this, right? So the bronze kind of background is all of that side scan imagery patched together, covering, uh, in this case, this is Gumby's reef, where I've overlain the bathymetry of it. Um, and then the blue circles are actually where we conducted underwater video surveys. So basically that consisted of a metal frame with two GoPros attached to it that we dropped down on a rope to the bottom of the lake. Um, I would let the boat drift and periodically lift the rope up, up and let the frame settle in a new spot. Interestingly, you can actually see how the day started out with the wind going from northwest to southeast. And then during this transect, it suddenly changed right in the middle and started coming from the northeast to southwest, and then all the remaining ones go that direction. Um, so once I take this side scan imagery, I basically zoom in on um, every last piece of it, go through it bit by bit in GIS, and delineate all the different types of substrates. And we come out with something that looks like this. So this is the substrate map of Gumby Reef. Um, and then what I can do from there is take the substrates that we're more interested in, in terms of lake trout um, spawning suitability. And I can map how those are distributed across the reef itself. Um, and this helps us again, visualize what the actual habitat that we're sampling down there looks like, what areas lake trout might be honing in on or aggregating for spawning activity. So, Obviously, I've talked for a few moments about looking for suitable lake trout spawning habitat with actually, without actually telling you what that is. So um, it's kind of been the subject of a lot of scientific discussion over the years. But in general, we think that uh, large piled boulders and cobble that are densely packed enough to create sort of these crevices, or, you know, nooks and crannies or what we might call interstitial spaces. Um, are what they're looking for because those crevices are areas where they can deposit eggs, will hold the eggs in one spot so that they're not blown away across the lake by the current, but still allow some fresh water to flow into that space um, so that they have plenty of oxygen while they're incubating. So these are just two spots. I realize that top image is pretty dark and maybe hard to see, but uh, these are two areas where I had good side scan imagery that actually matched up uh, with the underwater video, the 
if you can make out the red lines in the side scan imagery, that's the area that I've designated as that piece of potential spawning substrate. So you can see even in that imagery, there's a lot of boulders and, and, uh, and rough spots from all the piled up rocks. Um, and then that bottom image, I'll actually, that bottom left image, I'll actually take and blow up so you can get a good idea. I think this is pretty um, indicative of the type of thing I'm talking about. So this is from the largest spot of spawning habitat at Gumby's Reef. As you can see, um, pretty large boulders all packed uh, pretty tightly together and a lot of little crevices in between them. Um, and if you actually look in the upper right, you can see two lake trout hanging out right there. Um, this was in early October, so it's possible they were kind of starting to gather to spawn. Um, there's also a whitefish over here, if you look closely. Um, so now, like I said, I'd love to just give you like a little bit of a visual tour of what the bottom of the lake looks like. This is not an area people get to see very often. Um, so this is actually quite rare to see um, on the bottom of Lake Michigan right now. This is just bare sand or bare substrate. Um, you can see in the side scan imagery, it just shows up very, very smoothly. Um, this is rare because I think over what's most of the soft bottom areas of the lake, this is more what we see, which is that quagga mussels tend to be very clumped together and uh, patchily distributed with areas of bare substrate in between them and it has a bit more of a modeled appearance up on the the side scan actually moving on to the reef itself um, this is largely what we see them composed of fractured bedrock the name kind of says it all really um, just areas where the bedrock of the bottom of the lake is protruding up um, and over time weathered by glaciers water etc um, it's kind of broken up um, yeah, and, and this I believe this image is also from the sort of east slope of Gumby Reef. Um, there's areas where the bedrock is actually not that fractured, but still quite an intact, um, smoother surface. Uh, we refer to this as massive bedrock. As you can see, it's, um, it's just one large intact area of bedrock comprising the lake bottom. So uh, there's been doing this work for a few years now, and it's just been interesting to see. We have uh, a much greater uh, inventory sort of of known habitats in this offshore environment that we've got a pretty done a pretty extensive survey on. Um, we have a large number of habitats that we've uh, got a lot more documentation about, hopefully about their utility for lake trout, and this can hopefully guide any kind of future studies we might have in terms of trying to locate juvenile lake trout, try to study um, egg deposition, or possibly trying to study lake trout uh, movements and habitat use during spawning time. And like I said, I um, did a lot of underwater video work for this project. The main goal of that was so that I could compare actual visual observation of the lake bed with the side scan imagery so that I knew that what I was classifying as, you know, fractured bedrock, that's actually what was there. Um, but this means that we basically sent that camera down over a wide range of habitats, a wide range of depths. Um, and we have many hours of video, video footage of this area that we don't really get to see very often. Um, and obviously we have a lot of sampling gears, you know, we collect fish with nets, we might collect uh, bottom sediments with dredges and stuff like that. But actually being able to put it into context by seeing what's going on down there is pretty invaluable. So I think one of the most um, important parts of the, eco the bottom ecology of the lake obviously is invasive mussels. So quagga mussels do cover the vast majority of hard substrates at the bottom of the lake. Um, but interestingly, it's not entirely uniform. So for example, these are two images from the largest patches of spawning habitat, what I would say are probably the best patches of spawning habitat. The top one is from Gumby's Reef and the bottom one is from Lake Bluff Reef. And you'll notice there's actually quite a difference. Um, I don't really have an explanation as to why, but Gumby's Reef, you see almost total coverage by mussels. Um, and I would presume that that means that a lot of those interstitial spaces also are 
somewhat choked out by muscles or or are affecting they're affecting that that uh, interstitial habitat um, meanwhile lake bluff which is not that far away and at a similar depth we actually see pretty large patches of bare rock and um, you can even see it looks to me like those interstitial spaces are a lot clearer um, no real hard conclusions to be drawn from this necessarily because we haven't really dove in and studied it but it is interesting to know that there is this heterogeneity and that uh, this could kind of help us guide any future study we're able to do to look at what effect this might have on uh, the survival of lake trout eggs that are incubating in those spaces. Um, another interesting aspect, uh, still talking about mussels, unfortunately, um, is that the dead mussel shells are actually becoming a large part of the lake bottom in certain places. So when these mussels die, um, they detach, float around with currents, and sort of get deposited in certain areas. So these images are from Wilmette Reef. And as you can see, a lot of the sort of interstitial areas between the rocks are largely filled with those dead mussel shells that have been moved around by the current. Um, again, we don't know what this means necessarily. Uh, there's obviously a lot of small invertebrates in the bottom, you know, insect larvae, amphipods, um, and other things that are a part of the food web and important prey for fish. Whether or not those invertebrates might utilize this habitat or to what degree they um, exist in a higher or lower density in it, we don't know. But the fact that it's becoming so prevalent that in certain spaces we are just seeing large swaths of it um, is important to know. And in deeper habitats, so this was at Gumby's Reef, um, interestingly, rather than just see it sort of being uh, distributed widely across the reef, it seems like the current almost finds low-lying areas and just deposits tons of mussels into these big beds um, where they are just very, very dense. Um, and again, what this means for ecology of the bottom of the lake, we don't, don't necessarily know, but it's interesting to see. Um, and finally, moving away from mussels, another thing that might impact uh, bottom habitats is Cladophora. So this is a, a, an algae that grows to nuisance levels sometimes in shallower areas. So this is from Wilmette Reef, which is the shallowest reef that we studied, which means there's more light penetration and it helps that algae grow uh, to really high densities. And again, this could have an impact um, on the quality of this habitat for fish. Um, we also observed quite a few fish um, over time. The most common thing we saw were lake trout, uh, as you might imagine, because that's kind of what we were out, um, out to study. Um, we saw them in spaces you'd expect to see them, like hanging out off of, uh, off of steep cliff faces. Uh, this one's hanging out over, uh, uh, you can't see it very well, but sort of the largest patch of good boulder cobble spawning habitat at Lake Bluff Reef. Um, and we even saw a couple that were just hanging out over sandier bottom, although they were um, in relatively close proximity to the base of, of a reef in those two instances. Um, we did not see a lot of lake whitefish, but actually a, a, on one transect over the top of one reef, we actually saw quite an abundance of them. So lake whitefish are another native fish to Lake Michigan that um, suffered pretty heavy tolls from commercial fishing over the years and their populations are generally low uh, due to that as well as just the changing ecology of the lake. Um, but we saw a good number of them in this one spot and interestingly enough, uh, you may remember this is that uh, large um, patch of dead mussel shells that I was talking about, I actually observed them feeding, uh, foraging around uh, I know, again, it's hard to make out, but in those red circles, um, if you were able to watch the video, you'd be able to see uh, lake whitefish rummaging around in and amongst those mussels, uh, presumably feeding. And in the bottom right here, there was a group of about 10 of them all together. So that was interesting to see, and that's actually something that has been observed by um, other researchers uh, around the lake, actually. Um, round goby. Uh, Another invasive species in the lake, it's, it's hard to make them out, but if you can, uh, you'll start seeing tons of them in this photo. There's probably 30 or 40 of them uh, distributed around. Um, another invasive species that's been here for quite a while um, and is pretty prevalent across a large uh, amount of the lake bottom. 
Um, again, this is them utilizing that dense cladophora bed for, for habitat. Um, and one of the more interesting or unexpected things we saw uh, one day at one of these reefs um, was a large school of freshwater drum, all very large freshwater drum or sheep's head, whatever you might want to call them. Um, we usually think of these hanging out more near shore, shallower water, but um, they have been seen further offshore. They actually seem to enjoy following the camera frame around. How deep is that? Uh, I want to say... 13 meters or so, yeah, not super deep, but um, yeah. Um, so finally, uh, I'll kind of wrap up. This has been a very interesting project. Like I was saying earlier, it's given us just this uh, amazingly wide view now of what these bottom habitats look like and what that might mean for lake trout. Um, and I guess my hope that I'll leave you with is if we have another uh, report come out like this, um, not only will we maybe get Julian's Reef in the right spot, but maybe we will uh, actually recognize that there's a, a good number of potential uh, priority spawning habitats in the Illinois waters of Lake Michigan. So um, th thanks everybody for coming. Uh, if you want to talk or ask me any more questions about this that you're not able to ask today, my email is right there, um, wstacy2, that's at illinois.edu. I realize it's a little cut off on the screen. Um, and you can follow our field station if you want. I think we have a Facebook page. If you just Google or look up the Lake Michigan Biological Station, you can uh, check it out there. All right, thanks. Um, you guys have uh, ask some questions or anything you want? I'm going to just try to interrupt the question. Yeah. Uh, of the salmonoids, have any of them uh, been eating the invasive species like the winged salmonoids eat the uh, mussels? Uh, or is there one salmonoid that is targeting the uh, gobies rather than like? Uh... Yeah, I think, uh, I don't think any of the salmonids eat the mussels. And we don't really think at this point that much of anything is eating the mussels. But the round goby, yeah, lake trout, are, my understanding is starting to. Um, transition more and more to eating gobies. Um, I think brown trout also eat a good number of them. Um, those are the two main ones, the coho and chinook, I don't think uh, nearly as much, if at all. Julian's Reef, I want to say mm, the top, the top of it is right around maybe 90 to 100 feet or so. I want to say 90 feet at the top. And then at the base, you get down to maybe 145 feet. Okay. That's off the top of my head. I believe so. on the deep side, maybe and it goes. The lake trout spawn right on the reef or in the deeper spot? Or? We, it's hard to know for sure, right? So we can observe where they're at, where they're like really congregating. Um, but in such deep water, it's hard to, for us to really confirm exactly what spot on the reef they are like dropping their eggs because it's hard for us to get any kind of sampling equipment down to the bottom that can sample eggs in certain spots. Um, but we tend to think, or at least I think maybe kind of right on the top or some of the steeper sides. Are, uh, there's there's uh, lake shots that are close to the shore right now. Are they mm -hmm. spawning in there or they're just eating or what are they doing? We don't know for sure. Um, but yeah, we do know that uh, lake trout do get picked up in very close to shore this time of year. Um, it's just not been a focus of much study. Most, for the most part, we've been more interested in the ones that use these, you know, deep offshore habitats at spawning time. Um, I think we're somewhat skeptical about the success of any spawning they might do in the really close near shore area just because it's so turbulent during all those fall storms um, and all that wave action we are skeptical that those um, eggs would be as successful. Only uh, five more questions. <laughs> Have you in the years noticed where fish would the salmonoids I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Would fish uh, swim in schools or they're, they're more or less isolated single fish? I seen the, the picture of gumbies there where there's only one fish there. Mm -hmm. Were they ever swimming in schools like back uh, earlier or 
I don't know. I um where there would be like a yeah, like that, a a pile of them. that last image I showed was from the summit of Lake Bluff Reef. And where that camera came down, I think I could count about 10 lake trout all in, in the view at one point. Um so I do think they gather in in like close proximity uh in, in really designated hot spots. And there's been some studies that have used telemetry um, like up in northern Lake Huron where they and done really precise pinpoint telemetry work that shows that they really do come into small hot spots. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Uh, we do. I can I can hold off and take questions you know, later too if you'd like. One question from the chat that I was going to try to get in. Oh yeah. Uh, any insight regarding fish concentrations in the study areas? No, um, that. You can continue repeat the question to see if I can. Oh yeah. Uh, so the question is: Is there any insight regarding bait fish concentrations in the study areas? Um, no, not those areas specifically. We haven't focused on uh, on that for this study and. Um, the lake-wide uh, forage fish studies that go on don't really target these specific spots, so I couldn't really speak to that. Um, how much longer is the study going on, and what are the next steps? Um, that's a good question. Um, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. So the question was, how much longer is the study going on, and what are the next steps? Um, as with anything, uh, the way funding cycles work and uh, grant approvals and whatnot, it's not always easy to predict exactly. Um, we have covered a lot of the sort of more interesting or priority sites that we would have liked to cover with this. Um, there's other spots we'd like to check out if we could. Um, in general, I think the study is starting to wind down, um, but uh, there's a few other reefs that we'd like to look at in other interesting areas. Um, the camera work has been interesting to me. I could honestly just do it forever, but um, yeah, it, it kind of comes down to funding priorities and stuff like that. I think uh, just for time, we're going to have to move on to the next talk, but um, we're going to have a break after this talk, uh, and that'll be 10, 10 or so minute break, and people are welcome to chat more then. I think our next speaker is Carl Roots from Grand Valley State. I think we got the uh, slides working now to 